Thank you. I'll wait for the lights to come on. And I enjoy that, uh, and I say this every time, and the boys get to hear this, but I enjoy that last picture of that little girl praying. And uh, so precious are these children. Uh, Satan wants to deceive them that uh, into the Roman Catholicism way of thinking, of interpreting Scripture, which we believe is false. But he wants these children, Satan wants to, to deceive these children, but we need to give them the gospel, don't we? Just like this little girl praying, and this was from a national pastor. We got this picture from, uh, we ship Bibles, but our, just to reiterate, which we did in the morning time, just with some new people here, were the Salyers. And I'm in my 50s, and I've uh, uh, been involved in late, uh, local church ministry all my life. So I'm just a layman, just like y'all, who has um, surrendered to go. So, uh, to the uttermost. But we've served and surrendered to work in our local church for over 30 years. But I went on a missions trip at the age of uh, 42, 19, 2009, and came back home and knew that that's what uh, the Lord wanted me to do with the rest of my life. I knew I needed training, so the Lord called us to Ambassador Baptist College uh, to get our training. And um, I had my bachelor's already. And I got a master's there from 2011 to 2017. Took some survey trips from 2017 to 2019. And the Lord gave me greater focus on what he wanted us to do. And the first thing was to do is to plant a church in the island of Beliran, which is over 200,000 people. Uh, there are no there's no missionary there. I know of one national pastor. Uh, he's fundamental and uh, independent uh, King James uh, missionary, and I shipped him. Actually, that's Friday. We shipped him 400 pounds of, of Bibles and tracts. Now, uh, that is two big boxes of 200 pounds, and that only costs $220. It takes about four months to get there, but every box that we've shipped has gotten there. We've shipped over 15,000 pounds now. Uh, but, but inside those boxes, we put about 100 track, about 100, excuse me, 100 Bibles, and uh, some Bibles are Bibles that I get from printing ministries that are glue bound. And uh, the national pastors like to put those in each household. And then I, I send about a dozen uh, really nice Bibles that are, are stitched. And those Bibles will last many years. So those are for the uh, saved people in the church. Uh, I usually send about one super giant print Bible for guys like me in our 50s. Or sometimes the pastor's wife will snatch that one for her. And um, which is okay. I let the Lord uh, let them divide where that's going to go. So I usually send a super giant print, which I have a super giant print right here. And I usually send about three little dolls for the girls working in junior church all my life. And kids ministry, I know we can't forget about the children. So I get these little Chinese China dolls, the porcelain headed dolls that uh, people used to collect and spend many, many dollars on. I get them for, at the thrift stores for about five dollars a piece. These are little, and the little, little kids love those. Girls get some uh, toy cars for the boys. Uh, so that what's kind of goes into the boxes. Uh, one my my manager who uh, who picks up the boxes, uh, he says, well, since COVID, they don't get a lot of chance to get any meat. He said, you should send some little beanie weenies. Well, I don't want to send beanie weenies because I don't even like beanie weenies. You might like beanie weenies, but I don't really care for beanie weenies. So I go to Aldi's and I'll buy some canned spam, canned meat, uh, some things that they might not have, canned peaches, um, and uh, corn and potatoes. I don't think they have that there. I don't want to send them pineapples because they got better pineapples than we got better pineapples. Me and my wife discovered. I took my wife 2009. Uh, to the Philippines, and she loved it, and uh, took my older boys the next three trips. So um, there we are. So we're at 28% of our support. We started in January 1st. We only had one meeting uh, lined up in January and one meeting lined up in February, but Dr. Whetstone, you know Dr. Whetstone, Pastor? Funkhauser, okay. He's a leader of our, of our mission board, a great preacher. And uh, he said, well, the best way to do deputation is just to quit your job and just step out on faith and let deputation be your, your job. And that's what I did. And we didn't have any reserve money in the bank, but we stepped out on faith and the Lord met us uh, uh, every step of the way. Helped pay our bills. We're still renting a house and we got all the bills that we had before. And uh, he has met our needs. So it's great to step out on faith 
to do that. So um, that's where we're at, 28%. I can't believe that we've been in 40 churches. I've talked to missionaries and I'll say, how many churches have you been in? The missionaries that have gotten their support. And I've heard one say 300 churches. I'm like, wow, 300, wow. And then 200 churches and some say 100. Um, but you just take one church at a time, one Sunday at a time, and just enjoy and meet people. As I met you, met many of you here today. So we say thank you. This is something that we send. I sent 400 of these uh, yesterday. No, actually 800 to Beleren. This is Illustrated Romans. We're going to put this on our, I don't know if we have this, but it's got pictures. And it's in Tagalog. And uh, one of the national pastors said that's really good to send. So, with pictures. So that's some of the things that we send. So we want to plant one church in Beleren. We'll get into our message here in a minute. Um, and as I said to, uh, this morning, I want to say it again. Acts 20:28. 20, Take ye therefore unto yourselves and to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And we want to plant a church. And missions is all about planting local churches. You know, you can give a person a, uh, some people believe in social gospel, give them a, a pig and a cow and all this. But they uh, have a nice cow, but they're still lost. And we still need to uh, do nice things and give them a cup of cold water. But we need to give them a gospel first. And to plant local churches, why? Because Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. And a local church is so important to be a part of, to be active in, uh, to be faithful in. Because Jesus purchased uh, us, we are blood-bought with the blood of Jesus and the local church. And Matthew 16, 18, which they teach us in school, uh, in a Bible college, a very important uh, verse on the, the church. And upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we wanted to uh, start a Bible institute in the Philippines. Uh, and then we see that in the Great Commission. We'll get into the Great Commission here in a minute. It tells us to teach. And we want to distribute Bibles. Uh, as many Bibles and tracts as I can gather, uh, I want to send to national pastors and give them the opportunity to reach uh, their Jerusalem for Christ. And I don't see national pastors as competition, but I see them as uh, servants of the Lord that can reach their area. We just need to help them with gospel tracts. And that's what we've been doing and we want to continue to do. I have one ministry called Beacon of Truth. And uh, uh, the, the director said, Mike, how would you like it if we sent you uh, a container of Bibles? And I said, wow, that would be awesome. But I'm not really ready to do that yet. I, can only, I only know how to do Bible boxes. So that's our goal and Bible distribution and planning a local church and starting a Bible school. And the local church is so important. And that's what makes America great, the local church. We might think that our politicians, uh, our politician will make us our new president or our, our president we want to be president or the new Congress coming in will make America great. But it's actually the church, uh, the local church is what made, has made this country great. Uh, the preaching of God's word. And I'll just give this little illustration. I like to give it, but there was this man named Alex de Tocqueville in 1831, 1832. He, uh, he came to America at that time and he knew something was different about America. He said, this is a great country. He was a Frenchman and he was a France diplomat to America. And he says, I want to discover what makes this country so great. And it's very key what he said. He said, and he wrote two books on democracy in America. It's very famous about Alexis de Tocqueville. He said, I looked to the harbors and rivers and I couldn't find the greatness of America there. I looked to the fertile lands and the rich mines and I didn't find America's greatness there. I looked to the world commerce, its world commerce and its forests, its schools and democracies and its constitution. And I couldn't find the greatness of America there. But where did he find it? He found it here. He says, not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because she is good. And if America ceases to be good, she ceases to be great. And the greatness of America comes from pulpits just like this right here. And prosperity, teaching the word of God. And you are a part of the greatness of America by being in your local church supporting your local church, working through your local church, supporting the pastor, 
Because when you support the pastor, he's able to preach even stronger and stronger. Uh, amen? Amen. If there's not unity within the church, that hurts the pastor as he preaches. And those, and those pulpits will be aflame with righteousness as he uh, gives his word. So I want to encourage you to work in your local church. Make your church stronger. There's a great group here this morning, but we can fill it even more, right? The Lord wants his church to be full. And uh, as we uh, were taught in school, Brother Pastor Funkhauser, one teacher would say, the darker the night, the brighter the light. Dr. Spencer. And we're in a dark time, aren't we? We can see darkness. Uh, things that uh, many of you back in uh, your earlier days, you had never seen or even heard of the things that are going on today, right? We don't need to, to mention the evil going on that is flouted about on the TV, uh, through our culture, th even through our military, accepting things of evil. And uh, so we need to be in our local church, uh, supporting your pastor, working with your pastor, who is your under-shepherd, uh, to brighten this world. And let's look at missions. Let's look at missions, local missions. Let's turn to um, Matthew 28, and we'll get into our text here in a minute, but I just want to look in some in as an introduction, and then we'll get into our text. Matthew 28, 18, and that is the, the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18. And then we're going to talk about Josiah this morning, preach on Josiah. But I want to talk about local missions as an introduction. And let's look at the Great Commission. We all know this, but let's go over it again. Uh, Matthew 28, 18. And I'm turning there right now. Okay. And Jesus came and said unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So we see the Great Commission. Jesus is about to uh, go back up to heaven. He was crucified, he was risen, he would spoke to his disciples, and he gives them an order, a commission to do, a directive. He needs you to do this. This is a command. And we look back in 18, Jesus came and spake unto them. So who was the them? We see in verse 16, if you look up at 16, then the 11 disciples went into Galilee. So we see that Jesus had 11 disciples there. And he gives them the great commission to go ye therefore and teach all nations. And the point I like to make this morning is, if you're, <coughs> excuse me, if you're a born again Christian, you are a disciple of Jesus, aren't you? Amen. We are disciples. So it wasn't the great commission just given to the disciples, it was given to us. We are to fulfill this great commission. Where are we to fulfill the great commission? Let's look at Acts 1.8. And we all know this, but Acts 1 8, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. So, our Jerusalem, your Jerusalem is prosperity, as Pastor Funkhauser said. Right as you walk out these doors, you are in your mission field, your neighbors. Uh, you can give your neighbor a Bible. We've done that. We've given our neighbors Bibles behind us there in Lattimore. You can give your waiter or waitress a Bible. You can give them a whole Bible. You can order Bibles. Give them a New Testament. Uh, give Bibles throughout your city. Uh, John and Roman. Sounds like that's what you're doing. But be that missionary. Not just us. The Salyers are going to be missionaries. But we're all missionaries, aren't we? Let's turn to uh, 2 Chronicles 34.1. And I know we've opened the word, but if you uh, may stand with me, well, in honor of the word of God, let's let's read a few verses. Second Chron, if you're able, Second Chronicles 34, one through three is our text, and I'm going to uh, read, and then we'll pray, and we'll sit down. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, 
declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after God, the God of David his father. In the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we are alive and well. Our heart is beating. We have the opportunity to tell others about Jesus. I pray that we'll have the zeal as King Josiah had in the surrender to do your will as King Josiah in our local Jerusalem, in our Jerusalem, right here in America and in the uttermost part of the earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And today, our message, with our time remaining, the title of our message is The Surrender and Zeal of King Josiah. And this is a wonderful uh, person, godly king that we can learn many things from. And the surrender and zeal of King Josiah. The text is 2 Chronicles 34.1. My proposition is... We as disciples and missionaries must be surrendered and zealous for the gospel of Christ. We are not just the missionaries here. You would want your missionaries to be zealous and surrendered, don't you? That stand before this pulpit. And that's what we need to be, saliers. But we need to all be surrendered and zealous. Because not only we're missionaries, but we are all missionaries, aren't we? Because we've been given the Great Commission. So we need to have zeal and we need to have surrender. And Josiah was surrendered and zealous to serve the Lord in his day. So he served the Lord with zealous uh, zeal and surrendered. And we need to do that today, don't we? In our day. Because our day is right now. And we might think that we're going to live forever. We don't really think about the day that we're going to die or the day that we're going to be in our deathbed. But that day will come. And if we have not given the Lord everything, we'll have some remorse, won't we? We'll have some remorse in heaven. And we'll have remorse here in our deathbed wishing we would have done more. So let's think about that. Who is Josiah? Let's look at him in his heritage um, as we look in Josiah. Josiah's name, his name in the Hebrew means Je Jehovah heals. So this was a time in the history of Israel where it was a very pagan land. And the Lord told the Israelites not to worship idols, didn't he? But we find out that they did. They would fall into idol worship uh, through the different peoples that were still in the land that they allowed to stay in the land as you study the history. They didn't kick everybody out. They left some in and they used them uh, uh, to, as servants and they got taxes from them. But God says you need to get them out. But they disobeyed. And by disobeying the idols came with those people that lived uh, there as they came into Canaan land. And why would somebody want to worship an idol or a god? We think that's just crazy, don't we? We, Me being in pest control, I told uh, uh, everybody in Sunday school that I was involved in pest control. Commercial pest control, I would do s hotels and, and churches and restaurants. And I would see all different na type of nationalities. And I would see little idols in the Oriental uh, restaurants, the Chinese restaurants, Vietnamese restaurants, them putting fruit in front of this little Buddha. Or I'd be in the hotels and I would see them burning incense to an Indian god. There's a lot of Indians in the hotel. So idols are true and alive well, uh, wrongly, uh, sadly, in, in today's world. But do we have idols in America? We have idols too. Materialism is an idol in America. Uh, all sorts of idols. Um, we think of the industry, the entertainment industry, sports idols. It can be all sorts of different idols that we have too. You know, idol is anything that comes between me and the Lord. So if there's something that's coming between you and the Lord, we need to get rid of that idol, don't we? But his, his rule, his land that Josiah was born into was an, a land filled with idols. How do we know that? Well, we can look at his heritage. We look at, look at his grandfather. And we look at his, his father. But Josiah was the 18th king of Judah. So this is during the many kings. Uh, he is known for his reforms and his revival. Deuteronomic reforms. They would discover the word of God was lost. Can you imagine your Bible being lost? Can you imagine going through 
a whole year with not having the Bible are going through many, many years. And back then, they didn't have copies of Bibles. They had to handwrite them. And the lands got so uh, cluttered with, with idols and perversion that the Bible got lost, we would find in the story. Um, but he reigned for 31 years, 641 A.D. to 610. And he had an evil heritage. You might think about your parents. I think about my father and my grandfather. My father was a saved man. And my grandfather went forward for salvation. And um, in Michigan, my dad went to Bob Jones and tried to raise us as Christians. And um, so I can look at my, my, my heritage as godly. But he, uh, Josiah did not have a godly heritage. His grandfather was Manasseh, King Manasseh. If you know anything about King Manasseh, he reigned for 55 years, the longest reign in all Israel. We look at 2 Chronicles 33, 9. Just back up a little bit. Let's look at Manasseh. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed uh, before the children of Israel. So King Manasseh was leading his country to do worse than the heathen pagans. That's a, a bad description of what's going on. Not only did he do it for a few years, he did it for 55 years. Did he lead his country uh, in a bad way? Uh, and then his son, Manasseh's son, was King Ammon. Let's look at 2 Chronicles 33, 22, and 23. So this is Josiah's father, and this is the heritage that he has. This is Ammon. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. So did Manasseh's father. For Ammon sacrificed them to other carved images, and Manasseh, his father, had made, and he served them. And Manasseh humbled not himself before the Lord as Manasseh, his father, had humbled himself. Manasseh would repent later in life after being held in captivity. But Ammon trespassed more and more. So his evil was bad, and it was even getting worse. He was loving the evil. 24, and his servants conspired against him and slew him in his own house. He was assassinated. And we, we hear of the assassinations. I have heard of the assassination of the Japanese uh, president just recently. And an assassination still, even in America. Verse 25, of the people of the land slew all, all them that had conspired against King Ammon, because he was the Lord's anointed still, and the people of the land made Josiah his son king in his stead. So the point I'm trying to make is, it would have been very easy for Josiah to continue on in his wickedness. What couldn't have been? Because his father was wicked. His grandfather was wicked. And I'm not sure of, of your heritage, but if, if you're born in a, in a wicked home, it's easy to just follow into that, isn't it? Or if you're born in a Christian home, to follow into that. But he didn't have the, the luxury of being born in a godly home. So, but we're going to see something about Josiah. For, number, my first point was, Josiah was zealous and surrendered in his walk. If you can underline the word walk, if you're writing this down, with the Lord. So the first thing he was zealous and surrendered was in his walk with the Lord. 2 Chronicles 34, 1 through 2. Let's read that again. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. So he was only eight years old, just one year younger than my son right here, Micah. And he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. So he had a, a long reign, 31 years, um, but he started young, didn't he? We would find later that Josiah would die at a young age. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. So let's look at this young eight-year-old man, young-year-old boy, and he did that was right in the sight of the Lord. That's encouragement to us, too. We want to do right in the sight of the Lord, don't we? If the Lord were to walk, look at our lives at home, our private lives, what we see on our phone, what we watch on our TV, uh, we want to make sure that God would see that we're doing right in the sight of the Lord. Amen? We want to do that. And you know what? We have to daily uh, ask the Lord to help us, don't we? 
We're all working on our, in our sanctification. And he walked in the ways of David his father. He couldn't walk in the ways of his father Ammon. And he couldn't walk in the ways of his grandfather Manasseh. He couldn't walk in that example. So he had to go to what they told him about his, his great, 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 great grandfather who was a famous king. His name was King David. And no, King David made some mistakes, didn't he? But one thing about King David is he loved the Lord, didn't he? Amen. He got right with the Lord. He repented. He was a man after God's own heart. And Judah said, that's who I want to be like. I want to be like my great, my father, David. My great grandfather, David. <clears throat> and uh, are we walking with the Lord? We know that the Lord sees us. Genesis 16, 13. Hagar confessed, thou God seest me. So God is watching us. He sees us uh, doing right in the sight of the Lord. He sees if we walk with him. Are you walking on the Lord's path? Am I walking on the Lord's path? I can say that uh, for, there's been times in my life I haven't walked with the Lord the way I should. And there's times where I was doing good, working in my local church, but God wanted me to do something different. I fought with the Lord for two years about full-time ministry until I surrendered. And then I'm walking on the Lord's path. So are we walking on the Lord's path? Are you walking on God's path? Walking with the Lord. Psalms 119.1 Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. How can we know how to walk with the Lord? Is to read his word, don't we? Read his word. Ask the Lord, how, am I, how can I be more like Jesus every day? How do you want me to live today at work? Uh, you might not be in the position to go to the Philippines or to a mission field. But you can go to work and serve the Lord in your mission field at work. Or through your local church. How can I work through the local church? Can I teach a class? Can I go pick up some children? Can I uh, ask the pastor? And those are good problems to have, aren't they, Pastor? Uh, ten people to ask you, how can I serve? And he'll go to the Lord and, and he'll ask the Lord, how can we serve our community? It might be working through a nursing home. It can be all sorts of things. Reaching out to your missionaries and, and asking them, how can we send you? You can send Bibles to missionaries. All your missionaries that you support. Find different ways to serve the Lord, to walk with the Lord, to walk more like Jesus. Psalms 86, 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord, I will walk in thy truth. And let's walk the old paths. Jeremiah 6, 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask of the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. So we walk in the old paths, of just simply just spending time with the Lord. Uh, and listen, reading his word, listening and praying, those are the old paths. Singing the old hymns, and being in church. Giving our tithes and our offerings. Those are walking in the old paths. If we have to get idols out of our house, we have to purge our house, don't we? We get things in our house. It could be an old DVD you need to get rid of. It might be a cable channel to get rid of. It might be an app on your phone. I don't need, you might say, I don't need this app. Have an accountability, young people, uh, with your parents and with your wife. So we need to get those idols to walk with the Lord. So we see Josiah was zealous and surrendered in his walk. The first thing. The second thing we see Josiah is Josiah, he was zealous and surrendered in seeking after God. So first he was walking with the Lord and now he starts to seek. Not only just seek, he seeks after. We see that in 2 Chronicles 34.3. For in the eighth year of his reign... While he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. We'll stop right there. So, uh, with this passage, we do math. It's, you can be use this as a math. He got <coughs> started his reign at eight. Then in his eighth year, eight years of reigning, he started to seek after. So that makes him 16. Uh, simple math right there. And uh, he was looking, not just looking for the Lord, but he was pursuing after the Lord. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he was near. So the Lord can be found for all of us right now. Correct? There's going to be a time when we're going to be on the other side of life. And for all of us, it'll be sooner than we think. 
that our time on this earth will be done. And we need to seek the Lord while he may be found. Whether if you're not saved, today is a day of salvation. You could die today without Christ. And the Lord forbid you would have to stand before the Lord and ask. Uh, uh, the Lord would ask you, why should I let you into my kingdom? It's only for through the blood of Jesus. So you need to seek the Lord while you can be found, while you're alive. Call ye upon him while he is near. We need to seek the Lord as Christians, how we can be a better Christian, how we can serve and be a better church member through our local church. Let us seek after the Lord like Josiah did. Psalms 42.1, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. And we use that in the Sunday school hour. But just like that uh, deer running, looking for water, he's panting, he's searching for the Lord. Are you seeking after the Lord? Am I seeking after the Lord? We have to battle the flesh, don't we? We have to battle this old flesh. It's tired. Uh, it's weak. And but we need to get along with the Lord and seek after him and ask him, what would you have me to do? Just like Paul on the road to Damascus. He said, Lord, what would thou have me to do? What wilt thou have me to do? And we can ask the Lord that every day. What would you have me to do today? What would you have me to do this month, this year? Uh, Psalms 14.2 The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Is God, when he looks down upon you, does he see somebody who's seeking God? Are you seeking God? Am I seeking God? My third point was Josiah was surrendered and zealous to fight against sin. So he's walking with the Lord. He's seeking. Not, he's seeking after God as a young man of 16 years old. Let's look at uh, 2 Chronicles 34, 3b. Uh, halfway through 3. And in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places in the groves. So he's 12 years in his administration. And then he started at age 8. So 12 and 8 is 20. If my math is correct. And he said, you know what? Uh, the Lord's, I'm walking with the Lord. He's growing with the Lord. He's seeking after the Lord. He doesn't have the word of God. He doesn't have it because it's lost. They would find it later in the temple in the story. But he's just walking with the Lord. He's, he uh, has godly people in his life, it sounds like. And he sees all these idols. He says, we need to get rid of these idols. And he does it with zeal. He began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. So he says, we got to get the evil out of this country. And you know what? We have a lot of evil in our country too, don't we? We praise the Lord that the Supreme Court finally made a decision uh, that allows states to not have abortions. And, um, you know, we need to pray that all America gets that way too. Because there's a lot of blood on our hands in America, isn't there? There's a lot of evil in our, in our land. I went to the Philippines uh, back in 2017-18, and one of the Fili young Filipino young men said, uh, we really have a problem with our youth, with the, with the phones, with the uh, ungodly uh, pornography that comes from America. And I was there in the Philippines, and he said, this pornography is coming from America, and it's polluting our country. And yes, we love our country, but our country has many sins. We must uh, guard against those sins, make sure they're not in our lives, and pray against them. And praise the Lord that uh, the Supreme Court made that decision. We could praise the Lord for that. We need to make sure that we keep our lives pure, our homes pure from the sins, because there's many idols and why would people want to serve idols back then? Because there was a lot of immorality, there was a lot of drunkenness, there was a lot of fornication, and the men loved their evil. And Josiah says, we're going to get rid of this evil. Verse 4, And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence, and the images that were on the high above them. He cut down the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He break in pieces and made dust of them. <coughs> and strode them upon the graves of them that sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priest upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And he so did in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even unto Nathalia, with their mattocks round about. 
And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and beaten the graven images and the powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. And what he did was he fulfilled a prophecy. If you would study uh, earlier in the Kings with Jeroboam and Rehoboam, there would be a, a man of God that told uh, uh, the, the, the king that there would be a, uh, a young king named Josiah and he would strike down all these altars. And uh, that was a fulfillment of prophecy. What he did was he fulfilled prophecy in cleaning the land. Um, and God does not want idols in our lives. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. We need to love the Lord um, and not make gods. I know that even when I was working in my 30s, I was investing in my, my retirement fund, my 401k, and I just, I was raised to save money. My dad paid his house off when he was age 30, and he had money in the bank and told me to raise, save for a rainy day. Those are all good things to do, things in Proverbs, but it can be easily become into an idol. And as I was uh, in my 30s, uh, putting money into 401k and seeing it grow and moving it around, it started to become an idol in my life. I would think about it all the time and think about how I can use it later and, and try to see if it grow to be a million dollars. And the Lord had to get a hold of my heart, my heart and say that I, he wanted me to use that money to go to Bible college. And we had to, we gave that to the Lord and he helped us use Lord Jesus, this is a poem. I long to be perfectly whole. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever in thy soul. Break down every idol. Cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. My final point uh, this, this morning, Josiah was surrendered and zealous in his work for the house of God. So we see in 2 Chronicles 34.8. Now in the 18th year of his reign, he had purged the land and the house. He sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Messiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, and the son of Joaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord. So he's walking with the Lord. He's seeking after the Lord. He's getting the evil out of his life in the, in the community, in the nation. Now he's starting to work for the Lord. He wants to work uh, through the house of the God. He wants to build. He's seen that the house of God, the temple, Solomon's temple, got filled and cluttered with, uh, with pagans and idols, and they made a mess out of it. They had revelings and, and parties and uh, bad things, and the house, the temple became in disarray. Just like this beautiful, you have kept this church in beautifully uh, manicured outside, indoors, a beautiful sanctuary here. This, this church is not in disarray. It's well maintained because it's the house of the Lord. He says, I need to repair the house of the Lord. And Josiah uh, did that. Um, let's look at, let's read that again. Uh, verse 8. Now in the 18th of his year, he had to purge the land. Uh, we said that. And uh, uh, when they came, verse 9, when they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God which the Levites kept at the doors and had gathered the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim and all the remnants of Israel and the Judah, Judah and Benjamin returned to Jerusalem. And they put it in the hand of the workmen that had oversight of the house of the Lord. And they gave it to the workmen uh, that wrought the house of the Lord to repair and to amend the house. And they got busy in the house of the Lord. And my question is, am I busy in the house of the Lord? Am I serving the Lord through my local church? Uh, that's a question to ask yourself. Am I being faithful? Am I giving? Am I praying? Am I seeking God's will of how I can build a local church that Jesus Christ paid his precious blood for? And talking to him, praying for my pastor, how I can serve, praying for him, going out with him on soul winning and, and uh, encouraging him. And you can be a light through your local church, just like Josiah did. And I'd like to stop there. I just want to challenge you. Are you walking with the Lord? Are you seeking after the Lord? Are you getting sin out of your life? And are you serving the Lord through your local church? And are you listening to God, just like Mary of Bethany? How can I serve my Savior? And I'd like to close that today. If we can, uh, uh, Pastor Funkhauser, if you uh, close with the... With the, with the with the call here. 
Thank you guys for listening. It's a challenging message. When we think about the life of Josiah, uh, one of the things that becomes abundantly clear to me is that you have one soul who's been sensitive to the Word of God. As they've been searching out the whole house of God, they find a book and that book begins to convince his heart. And I'm not preaching to you. I'm just saying that uh, one man who got a hold of his heart, that Word of God got a hold of his heart, and it began to clean house. And you say, Pastor, I'm not, a, I'm not a king. I'm not a prince. I don't have that much control or that much power. But you have power over something. And that's your life and the decisions you choose to make in your heart. And uh, so praise the Lord for that. And I pray that you'll respond to that. What can I do in my life and how can I respond? What work can God do within my heart? And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I ask a question as I ask every service. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Has there ever come a day when you've received Him into your life? Would it be as, uh, as commonly reported if you would stand before God there in His beautiful heaven and He would ask you, why should I let you in? Now this place that's you know, perfect and there's no sin and there's nothing uh, that offends God in any way, a perfect and holy and righteous God, why should I let you in? You won't be able to say it's because I went to church or I got baptized. The Bible says the only way that we can get in is through the precious blood of Christ. Have you done that? Have you received that? And uh, have you done that? Received Him as your Savior? You say here this morning, Pastor, I'm lost. I don't know Christ. If I would be hit by a car, say today on the way out of church, I don't know if I'd be on my way to heaven or not. You can get that settled this morning. Anybody like that this morning? Anybody lost? Who just wants to hear the gospel? How can I get saved? And number two, you say, Pastor, there's some things I gotta get clean in my life. And I want to, by God's grace, make that decision this morning. Anybody like that at all? Pastor, I'm praying to God. He'll clean up some things in my life. Amen. Well, Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that You'll just be with us this morning. And Lord, however You worked in hearts and lives, may we respond to Your Word. May we clean house and may we get busy about Your business. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet really quick for a hymn of invitation. Brother Don, what was that hymn number again? 174. Hymn number 174. Stand to our feet, your hymn book 174. My Jesus, I love thee. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin. I resign my gracious Redeemer my Savior art Thou if ever I love Thee my Jesus tis Thou verse 4 in mansions of glory and endless delight I'll ever adore Thee in heaven so bright I'll sing with a glittering crown o'er my brow if ever I love Thee my Jesus, tis now. Amen. You can be seated. We want to take care of a little bit of business here. I want to ask uh, Miss Betty uh, McDuffie if she'll come forward. Um, she has came to me in private this past week and desired to join the church. And uh, we went over the church constitution. I realized that she was a member in the past and uh, of course a lot of work and things of that nature went on but uh, has a good testimony in the church and she did a great job taking care of her husband when he fell and uh, but anyway she's one of the ones that came out of the Catholic religion got saved uh, gloriously saved baptized and uh, 
Uh, she went, desires to join the church and has agreed to the adoption statement. And so with that, uh, I want to ask the church for a vote here to accept her membership. Brother Sheely makes a motion. Brother Ken, or yeah, Brother Ken. And Brother Ken. Okay, uh, all in favor? All right, praise the Lord. I knew that would be easy. Thank you so much. <laughs> she's a sweet soul. Glad to have her back into the church and busy. Well, she's been here, but uh, officially joined the church. If anybody at all wants to join the church or be baptized, please come up to, and talk with me and we'll make sure that happens, whether it's Nick or whether it's Brother Rush and uh, Mary and them. You know, if, if you desire to join the church and or baptism or whatever else, uh, I just want to take care of, of, of those matters. You can see me afterwards. But uh, well, praise the Lord for that. I hope you'll see our, our missionaries. They're going out to the Philippines. And uh, I think this study here will close with a word of prayer. And uh, Brother Coon, would you dismiss us with God's blessing? Father, we thank you for your word. We, Father, we thank you for every family's represented here this morning. Father, I'd like a message to uh, our missionary brought to Sunday school and this, what can we do for our church? Like, when the late president said, don't ask what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. The same here, don't ask what your church can do for you, but what we can do for our church. Well, I pray you meet each and every need. Be our missionary and family, they travel. I pray, Father, you help them to get their support. I pray you help them to stay faithful, help us to stay faithful to you. Father, help us to pray one for another. We thank you for Miss McDuffie, Lord. Pray that you bless her. And Father, I've been knowing her a long time. Bless her, bless her family. Help us to do what's right till you come for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Dwight, you better be first up here, brother. Come on. <laughs> All right. Um. <laughs>